I'm honored to be here with you today and to have just this little part in the gathering that you will have together as you seek God's way in your own life. May it be a time of revival, which has characterized the church in Korea for over a hundred years. I remember before my dad died, he turned to me and he said, son, where does a man go when he goes out with God? He was thinking of that passage which said, Abraham was called to go out and he obeyed and he went out with God. And dad said, well, it doesn't really matter where you go. He knows the way. All you have to do is follow. God's going to be speaking to all of us. And I just pray that as you hear his voice, you'll let the spirit of God lead you and come together in love. Go forth and fulfill his last command to make disciples of the nations to the glory of God our Lord. Amen. I want to talk to you about the very heart of the Christian faith in terms of our personal life and ministry. You know, the Bible tells us that love sums up everything. To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is the second aspect is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And out of that that great commandment, which it is called, comes the great commission, which is summed up in the last verses of chapter 28 in Matthew, where Jesus told his disciples before ascending up into heaven, he says, you go now and you do what I've been doing with you. You go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And I'll be with you all the way, even to the ends of the earth. Now, actually, before he gave the command, though, he made an affirmation of his own life and power by saying, all authority, all power belongs to me in heaven and earth. And I want you to keep that in mind because the one who sends us is the one who created the world, who has authority across, across every dominion. And that authority reaches across the whole earth to the farthest star. He's the Lord God, Jesus Christ, who died for our sin on the cross and rose again from the dead ascending back into heaven to take his place at the right hand of God. Love sums it all up. And because of love, we have an obligation. When God created us, he made us in his very image, we're told, in his likeness. God's a person. That's brought out clearly when we recognize that he is expressed as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's relational. And he made us with a mind so that we could know him and with a will so that we could resolve to love him. Love is a choice. And that choice is going to determine everything that we do in this world. So we look at Jesus to see what he's actually commanded us to express how we love him. And that's summed up in that commission when he sent out his disciples in his authority to go and make disciples of all nations. It's interesting, the object is to reach the world. You have any reason why that would be the dimension of this command? Well, God loves the world. He so loved the world that he took upon himself the judgment that belonged to his creatures who had chosen to rebel against him. Actually, in that disobedience, they were showing they loved the devil more than God. 
And that's really the essence of sin. It finally comes down to whom you love more than anything else. And to love God brings life all together for the reason we were created, that we might know him and love him and have our joy in him forever. That's joy, real joy. It's the reason you have joy every day, that you breathe the breath of life, to reach the world. And there are two things that you need to know when you go on a journey. You've got to know where you're going. And what's the second thing? How to get there. So our objective is to reach the world that God made to express his glory. Every creature, there's no differential, differentiation between home and foreign missions. Just one great big world that God loves so much. And we have the privilege of choosing him in love. Well, how do we do it? Jesus, again, made it very simple. He simply said, follow me. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life. Isn't it simple? When you come down to everything written in this book, he made it so simple that even a child can understand it. It's love. And when that love is fulfilled, you have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, we are told in the Bible that Jesus came in the world not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, he had made in advance the choice because of his love, even though we had rebelled against God and had brought judgment upon ourselves, and the judgment of sin is death. He accepted that judgment himself for us, no one else had that authority. That's how much God loved us. And that's the love that we embrace when we realize he loved us that much. But we reflect that love in the way that we do what he did for us. We did not come here to be served, he said. We come to serve. And the cross had already been in the mind of Christ before the stars were fixed in place. And that is spelled out every day that he lived. And those that began to follow him, and that was the invitation, just follow me. They began to ex dis discover for themselves the infinite dimensions of love that's unspeakable. Well, that's a life worth living. So he went around doing good, healing the sick, opening the eyes of the blind, healing those that were possessed of demons, teaching the gospel of the kingdom, and all through it, exalting the Lord God Almighty. People were drawn to him because they could see he cared about them. He loved them. And if you are known as a servant at responds to the need of people that you see around you, you're going to get their attention. And it's not surprising as you read through the Gospels, sometimes crowds of people gather around Jesus. Sometimes they number into the thousands. But that's not the general picture we get of Jesus. Reading the Gospels, he's talking to people along the way, wherever he finds them. He is ministering to people as a servant to go and replicate now in our lives the way Jesus lived every day. And there will be exceptional times when we will have great opportunities, perhaps to reach the crowds, but most of us are going to be willing just to live every day where he places us. God never makes a mistake. We're a servant. And no matter what we do, or however he calls us, or however we end up in some form of activity, we are servants because Jesus is a servant. And everything that we do reflects that love that God manifested to us. You see, that makes everything you do a joy. Put the spring in your step, a sparkle in your eye. And how did he communicate that love outside of, of himself? Well, he began to build relationships. And so here's another key to how we're going to follow him. Serving people, showing them that we love them, brings people 
close to us, they want to know more about us. What makes us different? And the relationships that we have with others will give us the opportunity to communicate how much God loves us. And that's the essence of discipleship. The word disciple means learner. Isn't that interesting? Here at a university, you're learning all the time. Well, that's what Jesus was doing, calling people to follow him, and they are called disciples, learners. You never stop learning when you're around Jesus. Whether you're listening to him preach in a crusade or whether you're just sitting around the table talking with him like he did most of the time. You're a learner, and that learning will continue all through life. That's why my life is exciting. Where is the greatest place to learn? You learn more there than you learn at a university. Where do you learn most of your lessons in life? Well, where are you closer to enough people where you can feel how they love you, how you can see it every day expressed? Where is that place? It's at home, isn't it? It's the family. So God did not treat us by ourselves to live eternally. That way he created us as a man and a woman, created a family, and in that context, we get our greatest education. You don't have to get a PhD in psychology or leadership to recognize we learn growing up, and that's the greatest education we'll ever have. And Jesus is creating that learning environment by calling a few people, usually one, two, three at a time. And that's where he invested most of his life. You don't have to have a crowd. Jesus spent most of his time on earth with a dozen men. And it should help us all to realize wherever we are placed, whether it's one or a thousand, we have an opportunity. But the smaller the group, the greater the opportunity for learning. That makes sense, doesn't it? So making disciples is just like raising kids. And that's what you're doing because you're learning now how to practice the lessons that you've learned growing up. You say, well, I didn't come from a perfect home. None of us have. But most of us here have had some real heartbreak in our families. And I've had students tell me, preacher, what you're talking about doesn't make sense to me because you don't know how I was abused, how I was rejected, how I was pushed aside growing up. Then I say, well, can you identify what went wrong? They have to admit, yes, I, I experienced it. I said, then if you will learn from your mistakes, you'll become the smartest man that ever walked on this earth beside Jesus. You've already seen enough failure and enough suffering to learn what you really want to be like. So in this context with a few people, building on what you've already learned, look at Jesus and you'll see how a perfect life unfolds. He never made a mistake. So that's what we're doing. He's not only our Lord, he is our God. And he shows us how our life can be filled with love. That's why this little book I call The Master Plan is an attempt just to see some of these principles unfold in the Bible. And we need a plan to find our way to what God made us to be. And it doesn't have to be elaborate. It just has to be simple. I think of a fellow on the campus who was going around wearing a big lapel button that had printed on it the letters B-A-I-K. Someone asked him what that meant. He said, that means, boy, am I confused. And he was reminded, well, don't you know you don't spell confused with a K? He said, man, you don't know how confused I am. Well, he's a typical college boy. But look at Jesus and you don't have to live in confusion because he says, I am the way. You want a plan? Well, follow Jesus. And you begin by showing people you love them, and you build a relationship close to a few people. The closer, the better. The smaller the group, the greater the opportunity for learning. And look at the people that Jesus were attracted to, or how they were attracted to him. They are not the most distinguished group in the beginning that you would recognize. Uh, they don't have college degrees in the beginning, so far as we know. Uh, none of them are members of the Levitical priesthood. That surprises you, doesn't it? 
These were basically ordinary people. Some were fishermen. Some were businessmen. One of them was a tax collector of all Greeks. Can you imagine that, that conglomeration of, he, of a dozen men that he finally chose to be close to himself? Well, all of us have a few people like that that you can be relating to now. You could call them your peer group. I think a fellow down in my home country in Texas who was arrested for horse stealing and he was asked by the sheriff, did he want to be tried by the judge or by jury of his peers? He looked confused and he says, peers, who on earth is that? And they explained, well, that means people just like you. And he said, well, I'll take the sheriff. I don't want to be tried by a bunch of horse thieves. Now, if you'll look around, you'll see your crowd where you're already known, where you live every day. And in that context, you're going to have your greatest opportunity to change the course of history. Just a few who are close with you. And in that relationship, begin to unfold in your life what you understand about Jesus. That's all you have to do. How it is. Of course, we come to Christ when we realize we are lost and undone. We're sinners. We confess it in true repentance, turning from it. And we promise then to follow him, which is the expression of our faith and the evidence of our love. Well, that's going to be the essence of our plan. It's that simple. But these people that are following you, they need to learn how to communicate what they have learned to those that are closer to them, to answer their questions, to explain what you really want out of life. We call that a testimony. And you do that with people here on campus, beginning maybe with your roommate or person that lives down the street. But the the purpose of it all is to bring them to know what you know and then to communicate that to someone else, to replicate what you have learned. That's what a disciple is. And these men that were following Jesus were simply told at the end of his life, you go now and do what you've watched me do. They could understand the Great Commission for one reason. They had seen it lived out before their eyes for three years, every day. Wouldn't it be wonderful if those people that are that close to you could come to the same conclusion? And they'll want to pass the good news along. And as it is repeated in one person after another, someday through reproduction, the world will have opportunity to hear about the love of God. Who could turn away from this gospel of love? Who would want to live any other way than to live like Jesus taught us to live and to simply be known as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Oh, that's a life worth living. And someday, his people will be gathered again. There is going to be a homecoming someday at the end of the trail. And we'll be with him forever.